Well, hello and welcome here tonight. I'm glad to see that there's a group of people that's interested in this very valuable nutrient called vitamin C, which happens to be valuable from the time we are trophoblasts and embryos until we take our last breath. So this is information that is really beneficial for everyone. Since I've learned the who, the how, and the when of vitamin C, and the many health and disease factors it influences, I found that my prescription writing has gone way down to almost zero, and my own health and the health of my patients has gone way up. So good nutrition and vitamin C, in my opinion, are two very key foundational principles to keep people healthy and keep them out of hospitals and out of doctor's offices, no matter what your age. One of the talks I did recently, there was a little girl who asked me why it was called vitamin C, which is actually a really good question that has a really complicated answer. Um, back around 1918, there was a diet that uh, was called the anti-scurvy diet, and it was made for rats, and they called it the C diet later. And then around 1920, um, it became, 1928, it became renamed um, hexuronic acid, but that was after the doctor that discovered it wanted to name it Ignose because he was ignorant of what the um, configuration of the molecule was, but he knew that it was some sort of a sugar. Then later on, we'll see in the medical literature, it called C-vitamic acid, and then the Europeans started naming it ascorbic acid, and that kind of stuck. And so today we'll see ascorbic acid and vitamin C used. Um, when they were naming vitamins, they named them according to the alphabet, usually A, B, C, D, and so on and so forth. But as time went on and people understood better what these nutrients and vitamins actually did, many of them were renamed. Animals use four sequential liver enzymes that are numbered here, one, two, three, and four, <clears throat> to convert glucose into another chemical down here that has a fancy name that is 2-keto-L-gulonolactone. And then that spontaneously shapeshifts into what is known as vitamin C or L-ascorbic acid. The reason that humans and some primates and some bats are unable to make our own is because that enzyme right there is non-functional in us. That enzyme is called L-gulonolactone oxidase for anybody who cares. There are different concentrations of vitamin C in different parts of the body. It's very highly concentrated in the adrenal gland, in the pituitary, the eye, the brain, the kidney, the heart, and skeletal muscle. So there are animals that make their own vitamin C. So let's have a look at the amount that they make. A cow, for instance, will make 18 milligrams per kilogram per day. And that means that their daily total is around 12,000 milligrams that they make in their own bodies. And then they get a lot from what they're eating around them. Then there are cats. The average house cat makes around 20 to 40 milligrams per kilogram of vitamin C per day. And their daily total is around 180 milligrams. And then if they're eating any mice, they're getting more because live animal tissue also has a good degree of vitamin C in it. Then there are animals that are dependent on vitamin C, like us and primates and some guinea pigs. And so primates eat in the wild about 30 milligrams per kilogram per day for an average of about 4,500 milligrams in a day. A guinea pig, whether it's wild or in a lab, requires around 33 milligrams per kilogram per day for about 30 milligrams total. Then there are goats. Goats tend to make a lot of vitamin C, and they tend to very rarely get sick. 185 milligrams per kilogram per day is the average synthetic rate of a goat when they're healthy. And when they're stressed or they're sick, they can make several fold more than that, up to 100,000 milligrams per day. Then there's me, and I make none of my own vitamin C, and the recommended dietary allowance for me is about 75 milligrams per day. If I was a smoker, we could add 35 milligrams per day onto that. And that gives me around 1.2 milligrams per kilogram per day, which is, is what the National Institutes of Health say I will remain healthy on. When you consider that one cigarette consumes about 25 milligrams of vitamin C, and that the recommended dietary allowances only allow for 35 extra milligrams, you can see that a smoker, just by virtue of smoking a few cigarettes a day, would be depleting their vitamin C stores very rapidly. So the recommended daily allowance for human beings is rather ridiculous. Um, 
whether you're considering how much you get in food or what you're supplementing. It's just simply not enough. The determination of this recommendation for humans was made on a very small group of healthy adult male volunteers. And there's a doctor named Dr. Steve Hickey who has written about the numerous flaws in this National Institute of Health recommended dietary allowance and their analysis. So while the medical authorities think that 75 to 90, mil it's 90 milligrams per day, by the way, if you're a male, 75 if you're a female. So while the medical authorities think that 75 to 90 milligrams per day is sufficient for humans, the question is, what are the actual blood levels in people that are walking around out there? Well, when a group of people considered normal had their blood tested, this was the result. Now, these were people that were going to have blood tests in an outpatient medical center. And what they measured on them was that 84% of them were considered normal. And what they considered normal was a level greater than 28.4 micromoles per liter. Well, I don't consider this normal because I know that the average male, if they eat two kiwi fruits per day, can get their level up to around 70 in the skeletal muscle. They found that 13% were subnormal, less than 28.4, and that this small percent, 3%, were outright deficient and on the borderline of scurvy uh, with 11.4 micromoles or less. This study calls to question the nutrition of these people and the utilization of vitamin C in their bodies by processes that they may not even be aware of. It also shows that they don't have much reserve if they should need to deal with toxins or illness. In the same study, 21% of patients who were admitted into the hospital were considered normal by their low standards, right there. 19% were deficient and 60% were subnormal. Now this is because vitamin C, low vitamin C levels make us susceptible to illness and it's because illnesses consume large amounts of vitamin C. The graph on the bottom right here shows hospitalized patients in the black bars and it shows the outpatients in the white bars with the percentage of uh, patients that had these various levels in micromoles per liter. <clears throat> There's a predictable overlap between them. And you can see that some of them actually did hit levels up around 100 to 150, and some of them were supplementing. Nearly one in five hospital patients here had vitamin C compatible with scurvy, and those with vitamin C levels and those vitamin C levels fell further prior to discharge. But worse yet was that the 24% of these patients that were taking vitamin C prior to discharge, most of them had it discontinued by the doctors when they admitted them to the hospital. Because most hospitals never consider or bother testing vitamin C in hospital patients, a large percentage of discharged hospital patients are walking around like ticking time bombs. But even if doctors did know that the levels were low, what would they do about it? One doctor who practiced medicine in the 1950s had a rather snarly comment about his colleagues when he said that there are some physicians who would stand by and see their patient die rather than use ascorbic acid because in their finite minds it exists only as a vitamin. This was Dr. Frederick Klenner, and he was an outstanding physician in the 1950s, and he wrote many articles detailing his successful use of vitamin C for tetanus, for polio. He cured 100% of his polio cases with vitamin C, for snake bites and spider bites, for measles as well as other infectious diseases. He also wrote about his use of high-dose vitamin C during pregnancy and prior to delivery, and most of his articles are actually available online for free. Dr. Klenner understood the values and properties of vitamin C very well because it was an indispensable part of his medical practice. He proved that vitamin C was more than just a vitamin. Some New Zealand doctors have shown that New Zealanders are walking around with vitamin C levels that are clinically subnormal and that it's easy to bring the level of vitamin C down and to bring it back up with just a little bit of fruit. These were a group of men in their 30s, and you can see they started out with levels of vitamin C that were pretty borderline. They were around 28 to 42, I believe, was the range. And then they asked them to, you know, to cut down on foods that had vitamin C and not to take any supplements for about five weeks, and the levels dropped you know, pretty low, around 23. Then this group here, they asked to eat, consume one half of a kiwi fruit per day, 
And this group up here, they asked to consume two kiwi fruits per day. And you can see that the levels were markedly higher than the, what they were finding in those outpatients or those hospital patients on average, 50 for the half kiwi fruit and 70 for the two kiwi fruits. So if everyone ate a minimum of five fruits and vegetables per day, their levels could be presumably even higher than this. You can divide the need for vitamin C in two categories. There are everyday needs such as detoxifying chemicals like car fumes, preventing damage from environmental sprays or from any poison because vitamin C acts as an electron donor to fix the damage. Vitamin C is an antioxidant. It can also protect people from pollen and allergies by acting as an antihistamine. There are other states that have high histamine levels that are also problematic. Medical literature shows that when there are high histamine levels, there are low vitamin C levels, and when there are high vitamin C levels, there are low histamine levels. And this uh, change happens very rapidly after taking a dose of vitamin C. So any state where the blood vessels or the lymphatics are leaky can potentially be um, ameliorated by vitamin C supplementation. Vitamin C also keeps your bones and skin and neurotransmitters in working condition. It maintains hormones at steady levels. It's a cofactor for carnitine, which is a protein that shuttles fat into the mitochondria, which is where the, most of the energy of our body is produced. And so that means you can have lots of energy to run around the block, and so fat doesn't accumulate where it doesn't belong and become toxic or deadly. The second category where vitamin C is crucial is for two conditions which fill the waiting rooms of medical practices all over the world and are occurring in younger and younger people. These two medical conditions filled my waiting room as a nephrologist, a kidney specialist, because kidney disease is often preceded by these two problems. Diabetes, both types 1 and 2, are becoming worldwide epidemics and are both largely preventable. Diabetics have more inflammation and low, lower vitamin C than non-diabetics. Vitamin C has also been shown to help with every aspect of glycemic control, and high levels of oxidative stress drive the progression of diabetes and its complications. We know that glucose handling is improved with vitamin C. Insulin sensitivity, production, and release are improved with vitamin C. We also know that there are higher requirements for vitamin C in diabetics, that they have more inflammation, and that they have competition for um, vitamin C uptake because their sugar levels are higher. And this is a problem even if you're eating a lot of sugar in your diet while you're taking vitamin C because sugar and vitamin C are both taken in at the same receptor on the cells. An insulin injection will also lower vitamin C. It's an inflammatory injection. And blood vessel health is extremely important in diabetics. If you know any diabetics that have advanced disease, you might know that they develop uh, peripheral vascular disease and can get gangrene in their feet and their hands, and they can also get problems behind the eyes, retinal diseases, the small blood vessels. Because th when the sugar is elevated and there's all that inflammation, new blood vessels tend to grow and the old ones are diseased. Well, vitamin C can actually have a very beneficial effect upon the problem with blood vessels in diabetics. Heart disease is another problem which is caused by too much oxidative stress and toxin exposure, both from inside and outside the body. Every risk factor for heart disease is amenable to vitamin C. Just take, for instance, blood vessels, which are multi-layered and glued together with what's called ground substance, which is like mortar, around the cells in blood vessels, which are like the bricks. Without vitamin C, what would otherwise be a healthy blood vessel splits into layers and becomes vulnerable to atherosclerosis. Low levels of vitamin C, focal scurvy, meaning areas in the blood vessels that have low levels that are, that are on the borderline of scurvy, is known to be present in areas of weakness in those blood vessels and where damage occurs. Dr. Patterson wrote a very interesting article in 1941 that showed this on biopsy specimens in people who died of heart disease and not heart disease. They found that where there are weak areas in blood vessels, there were low vitamin C levels. Vitamin C is also very beneficial for cholesterol metabolism, um, just the metabolism itself, as well as that cholesterol often rises when there's a toxin in the body, and vitamin C is excellent at dealing with toxins. There are numerous 
uh, articles in the medical literature uh, from decades ago and recently showing that supplementing with vitamin C lowers blood pressure. So what is oxidative stress? It can be a natural process which happens every day as a result of the following. Breathing, air that has oxygen, the breakdown of food, even healthy food, causes oxidative stress in the body, the low levels of background environmental chemicals, and while we're colonized with viruses and bacteria and fungi, and that's also part of being healthy, if those viruses, bacteria and fungi, breach our borders and get into our blood, there are white blood cells in there that use free radicals to kill those microbes and dissolve them. Now in low states of vitamin C, those white blood cells can break open and spill the toxic contents into the body. But even when that happens, we have mechanisms in the body to detoxify them. We have other antioxidants in our body besides vitamin C. Also, life is full of psychological stress and there are mechanisms inbuilt to deal with that. So all of these things can be occurring and we can have inflammation and the inflammation can be dampened after the, the, the job is done that needs to be done or the stimulus is gone. Normal levels of oxidative stress contribute to cell signaling. They contribute to gene transcription. So not all oxidative stress is bad. Even though there are healthy beneficial levels of oxidative stress, the low levels of stress can turn into a raging bonfire and cause serious problems as can acute traumas. On the right, we see how some of the normal events on the left can extend into problems. So war is a situation where there is psychological, emotional, and physical stress and trauma. Often there is food deprivation as well. And uh, this can be problematic and set off a bonfire of oxidative stress. Death of a close family member and prolonged grieving can also be very inflammatory to the body. Sepsis, which is an extension of this uh, that didn't go well, extremely uh, detrimental if, um, if it doesn't stop, then you know, the environmental chemicals can be too much. If there's heavy spraying or if there's a lot of smoking or um, drugs or chemicals in the body, then that can also set off an oxidative stress bonfire, which can be a problem. So there's normal breakdown of food that causes oxidative stress that we can deal with. But when we eat food that the body can't recognize, like trans fats, for instance, it, it creates enormous amounts of inflammation and oxidative stress because the body really just doesn't know what to do with it. Then there's any kind of ongoing stress at all that can continue that bonfire. The overproduction of free radicals can cause damage to nerves, to proteins, to DNA, to mitochondria, which are basically the powerhouses of the cell where the energy is formed and to lipids or fats, which can lead to a bunch of different diseases, including atherosclerosis, cancer, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, heart disease, chronic inflammation, strokes, and septic shock, and that's just naming a few. There are two groups of antioxidants. Some of them act as enzymes like glutathione peroxidase, uh, superoxide dismutase, and catalase. These are things you may have heard of. And then there are others that are non-enzymatic, like vitamin C, you may have heard of lipoic acid, and then there are polyphenols, which we can get from drinking good teas, and carotenoids, which we can get from eating good food. Well, these all help dampen down the inflammation that's caused by oxidative stress. <clears throat> vitamin C acts to prevent damage by interrupting chain reactions and by acting as a direct antioxidant. The flavones and minerals that can be in our diet and should be in our diet um, has a natural vitamin C assistance in the preservation process because it basically chelates out, meaning it binds together metals and toxins, which makes this vitamin C actually go further. Well, most people know the term oxidative stress, but very few people can explain it. Most people have heard the term free radical, but very few people can explain why a free radical can become your enemy. Your immune system uses free radicals to your benefit, like I said, to destroy bacteria, viruses, and fungi. But a bonfire of radical oxidants that gets out of control can make you very sick and even kill you. If you don't understand what a free radical is and how it causes oxidative stress in the body, it's really hard to understand how and why vitamin C or any other antioxidant controls the damage and keeps the body working well. 
So while this next part may look like a detour, we need to look at what oxidative stress is. To describe what free radicals do, we have to do a little bit of nerdy chemistry, but it's nothing more than you would have learned in a basic college chemistry course. So let's look at something that you know about already, water. Why water? Because in the body, water can be broken apart, and a byproduct of water can become a very common free radical that's very toxic. How can water be broken apart? It can be broken apart because water is a combination of two different atoms, hydrogen and oxygen. So this is a, a very limited version of the periodic table of the elements, which basically tells you all the different kinds of atoms that, that matter is made out of. So this just gives you a few of them. What's interesting about the periodic table is you can learn how things combine and why they combine. So looking at, let me just show you this side here. And what I want to draw your attention to is this circle in the middle, okay? See in the circle in the middle that all of them have two dots. And each of those two dots represent two electrons. And this is called the inner shell. And you can see hydrogen over here only has one dot. This inner shell is only satisfied when it has two electrons in it. If it doesn't have two electrons in it, it's going to go out because just like humans, atoms like to be in pairs. And so that's going to go out and try to find another electron. Then if we look in the outer shell of this one, these are called the noble gases over here because these are happy elements that don't try to go out stealing or matching up with other atoms because you can see that their shells are filled. These are called shells where the electrons live. This second, um, this is called an orbital. This second orbital takes a maximum of eight electrons and it's only satisfied when it's got pairs, all right? So this one has the maximum amount in neon, four pairs. We'll look at oxygen. Oxygen has one pair there, one pair there. It has a single one there and a single one there. And these two can't pair up with each other. It's just not the way it works. So oxygen wants to go and either pair up with another oxygen like O2 or it wants to bind up with two hydrogens, one there and one there, and that's how water is formed. But it's kind of interesting to look at some of the other parts on the periodic table, I think. Like if we just look at this element here, aluminum, you see that in the outer shell, this is the third shell, this one also can take 18 atoms, but you see it's only got three, and they're sitting there all by themselves. Aluminum is highly reactive. It wants to steal electrons from your body. It's in vaccines and it's a problem. It's a very strong oxidative stress inducer. We can also look at uh, fluorine, fluoride. Look at that, seven electrons in the outer shell. It wants one. Again, it's a very highly reactive um, substance on the periodic table. It's very toxic. Carbon always wants to pair up with four. See, there's one, two, three, four. So you're always going to see carbon pairing up with four things. You're always going to see nitrogen pairing up with three because it has three unpaired electrons. Okay, so that's your crash course on the periodic table. Well, one of the reasons that we're talking about water is that water is essential for life and that it's a crucial part of metabolism and the creation of energy. A free radical is often a byproduct of water that's missing an electron, okay? So we're going to talk about hydrogen and electron as if they're interchangeable because as you see, hydrogen is basically made up of one electron. It also has a proton and a neutron, but for our purposes, we're going to think of it either as a hydrogen or an electron. And that's what's important when we talk about free radicals. <clears throat> so let's just look at water for a minute. Now that you've seen the periodic table, you'll see exactly what's going on here. This is the oxygen. Its inner shells have two electrons. It's happy. Its outer shell has one pair there one pair there, it's got one single one here, one single one here. So it wants to pair up with two hydrogens. So what happens is the hydrogen goes up and with a uh, covalent bond, meaning that they share this bond of two. So hydrogen is now happy, it's got its two electrons in each, uh, each there in the orbital. And oxygen is now happy because of the sharing that's happened here, all of its electrons in the outer shell are paired up. It's not gonna cause any problems in your body. It's actually very helpful and we need it for life. Then, then, because of hydrogen bonding, the, the charges of, of the water molecules actually line up, and then sheets of them, you can imagine sheets of these water molecules in a three-dimensional um, construction, make up actual water. And it's so strong, these bonds are so strong that you might see little bugs actually walking on the water, and that's why they're able to actually walking on these, these molecules that are together like that. 
So this is a free radical. So what's missing? Now that you know how water is formed, you can see what's missing from this free radical. It's one hydrogen atom, right? So over here we have oxygen, one, two, three, four, five. And this one here is missing its hydrogen. And this one here has its hydrogen, OK? So this is a very toxic free radical that's formed in our bodies when metabolism doesn't go right. Instead of being a safe, valuable molecule called water, it's changed into this dangerous free radical, which can cause mayhem in the body unless it finds a hydrogen electron from somewhere. But where will it do that from? It'll do it from anywhere it can. Anything that's close at hand, whether it's DNA, whether it's mitochondria, or a cell membrane, or a protein, or an enzyme, it'll steal any electron that's around, unless something stops it. So some sort of antioxidant has to turn this dangerous radical into water. And vitamin C is an ideal donor, because it doesn't steal after it donates. And that's the difference. And that's what we are building up to here with all that. So on the left, this is basically a fluoride radical that is being neutralized by an antioxidant that's donating an electron or a hydrogen, OK? Then on the right, this is our hydroxyl radical. It looks a little different, but you'll recognize it. This is the oxygen which it, with its two unpaired electrons. And this is the hydrogen with its one electron. So this is still missing a hydrogen over here. And you can see that an antioxidant that has all these electrons to spare can now donate an electron over to this molecule and make it a complete water. Now it's safe and can be used in the body and not causing a problem. This is how antioxidants work. So you see this thing over on the left that looks like it has arms and legs? That's vitamin C. Vitamin C works in the body in two different forms. Here we have the hydrogen that can be donated as an antioxidant here. And we have a hydrogen here that can be donated and used as an antioxidant. You might also see sodium ascorbate. If that's the case, then this will actually be a sodium, and this will only have one hydrogen to donate. Then, after it donates the hydrogens, it becomes something called L-dehydroascorbic acid. This doesn't have to go stealing any electrons. It's satisfied, and above being satisfied, it can now go and become recycled. And that's one of the beautiful things about vitamin C, is that it doesn't continue stealing, and we have this happening. There are certain cells in the body that prefer the used up kind of vitamin C, this one here, OK? Certain nerves in the brain, red blood cells, the mitochondria, certain bone cells, there are some liver cells, and a bunch of other cells that actually prefer to use the used up kind of vitamin C. It goes like this. Okay, this is the mitochondria inside the cell. This is where the energy is made. This is the cytoplasm, or kind of the, you know, where all the other things in a cell live. And this is the outer membrane of a cell. I remember I was telling you about how in diabetes you have competition for sugar. Well, that's because these are called glucose transporters. So those glucose transporters can bring in glucose, or they can bring in used up vitamin C. So what you have here is ascorbic acid. This is the fresh ascorbic acid that came from your vitamin C, either in your food or your supplement. And then you have a reactive oxygen species, like that uh, hydroxyl radical that I just showed you, that needs an electron. So vitamin C will donate it, and then it will become this used up, or dehydroascorbic acid. Now that can have a few different fates. It can come into the cell, and it can be recycled into, into ascorbic acid, and it can do a job in there and take care of another reactive oxygen species. Or it can come into the mitochondria, because that also has one of those special transporters. And it can get recycled into regular ascorbic acid. And then it can deal with another problem in there. And it turns out that the mitochondria actually stores up a lot of uh, vitamin C this way, by taking the used up vitamin C and keeping it in there. Because the mitochondria makes a lot of re toxic reactive oxygen species that need to be dealt with right away, or they actually kill that mitochondria. One of the things they're not sure of is whether that used up vitamin C leaves that way. Another fate of vitamin C is that it can be lost in the urine after it turns into this used up kind. So say you get super sick, and these cells here just can't keep up with the um, turnover of the good fresh ascorbic acid into the used up kind, then what will happen is you'll just pee it out in the urine and it'll be gone. But that means that you need an influx of new fresh vitamin C. And that's why when you're sick, you need to keep taking vitamin C. 
The other fate is that it can be turned into oxalic acid, and that's why if too much of this builds up in the body and can't be recycled, it can crystallize in the body and it can be a problem. We don't want that to happen. Well, for pregnant women and babies, the concentration of vitamin C in the body is very important. And as you can see here, the levels of vitamin C in the um, placenta, for instance, is two times what it is in the maternal blood. The level in the cord is two times what it is in the mother's blood. And the level in the baby is the same. The level in the amniotic fluid is three times what it is in the maternal blood. Now this baby is basically drinking this amniotic fluid and it's going in and out of the, what will be the lungs. And it's basically marinating in that because vitamin C is so important for cell division. It's important for growth. It's important for good bones and so many processes in the body that this, this growing baby here will take vitamin C from the mother even if she doesn't have it to give. And even if she ends up having scurvy, the preference will be to bring it into that, that uterus there. In addition to that, vaginal delivery and labor use enormous amounts of vitamin C compared to cesarean sections. And that doesn't mean cesarean sections are good, it just means that there's a difference and that there's a need for it during the stress of being born. Being born and having, a, um, having labor and that baby coming down and having its head crunched is very stressful on it. And there are high levels of catecholamines and oxidative stress and so, during that process, if you compare a vaginal delivered baby to a C-section delivered baby and mother, you'll see that um, the levels of vitamin C in the mother's blood, in the amniotic fluid, and in the baby's plasma are about 20% of what they are during a cesarean section. So that's how much antioxidants are needed during delivery. So these are the levels, stress levels of an infant at birth during a vaginal delivery. You can see here that it's the highest of anything that I know of is an infant at birth, almost 50 um, nanomoles per liter. Um, this, a good comparison here is a disease called a pheochromocytoma. This is something I dealt with as a nephrologist because it's a tumor on the adrenal gland that can raise the blood pressure and raise the pulse rate and can cause strokes and heart attacks and can be very deadly and needs to be dealt with very carefully um, and as soon as it's diagnosed. So infant at birth has higher catecholamines than even somebody with that disease. A man during exercise is down here. This is a woman during delivery. And this great article by Lager, Krantz, and Slotkin also stated that the levels of a baby being born are even higher than an adult who's having a heart attack. So why would this be? It's not a mistake. Catecholamines have vital functions for the newborn. It's necessary. So they create a window of alertness for that baby so it can bond with the mother and have its first few drinks of colostrum and clear fluid. It clears the lungs out and dilates the bronchi. I mean, think about it. When you are stressed out and your catecholamines are high, what happens to your mouth and your mucous membranes? It gets really dry. But that's good in a newborn. That's what you want. It prevents fluid. It makes the fluid come out of the lungs. It also will increase the glucose levels because after all this stress of being born and it hasn't had its first drink, you know, the glucose levels in a newborn can drop, but catecholamines raise glucose levels. So that's another purpose for it. The other thing is that newborns generally have an oxygen saturation of about 60%, where you all have what, about 95 to 100% oxygen saturation. So the catecholamines also help the cells deal with that low level of oxygen until it comes back up. So this is one of the few times in life where high levels of catecholamines are not only necessary, they're well tolerated. But the trick is that afterwards it has to be dampened down. The mother produces the antidote in the form of beta endorphins in her milk and other contents in milk that are anti-inflammatory. And the blood from the cord and the placenta also have stem cells which are anti-inflammatory, which is another reason why the cord should not be clamped after the baby is born. Having a, a low amount of blood going into that baby and leaving 40% of its blood behind by clamping that cord right away also prevents the, um, the dampening of that oxidative stress and in, also is inflammatory to have that blood loss. Anybody who loses blood is put into an inflammatory state. So if the mother doesn't have enough vitamin C or if there was an immediate cord clamp or drugs or any of the other many ways the medical system interferes to deplete 
oxidants, antioxidant stores, the baby can make its own antioxidant. Guess how? Anybody want to take a guess about what's going on with that baby? It's jaundiced. Right. Supposedly, according to our medical literature, jaundice is normal for 60 to 70 percent of newborns today. But for some reason, doctors and a lot of people think that it's a problem. But the medical literature shows that bilirubin has a protective function by mopping up free radicals that were created by birth and the transition into breathing oxygen. Antioxidants after birth help to suppress general inflammation and keep the immune system tolerance in place, and that's very important uh, for the first two years of life. There are numerous ways for a newborn to get the antioxidants it needs after birth. This study looked at the levels of vitamin C and vitamin E between babies who did not have high levels of bilirubin and babies who did. What they found was that there were vitamin C and vitamin E levels were much higher in the babies who didn't have high bilirubin, and they were lower in the babies who did have high bilirubin. So what's probably happening here is that bilirubin can act as a plan B to mop up free radicals when there aren't enough nutrient antioxidants present, or when excessive oxidative stress continues as a result of medical interventions like cutting the cord or giving antibiotics or infant formula to the newborn. These can all increase oxidative stress, especially the formula and um, antibiotics because that alters the bowel flora, which are part of what keeps that baby anti-inflammatory. Well, this study didn't conclude that vitamin C prevents jaundice. It just said that there's an association between low vitamin C and E and high bilirubin. But this next study did ask the question, what happens if we supplement pregnant women with vitamin C? This was an Italian study done in 1957 that somebody translated for me. And what this doctor did is he took 89 pregnant women during the first trimester of pregnancy, and he gave them one gram of vitamin C orally every other day for six months. He didn't find 60 to 70 percent of uh, babies with jaundice. What he found is that it was absent in 61 percent of his babies. It was mild in 24 percent, moderate in 3 percent, and it was not known in 1 percent. It turns out that babies who have enough vitamin C don't need to have high bilirubin levels. Compare these results to the usual 60 to 70 percent of jaundice with the medical system today. Because bilirubin, like vitamin E and C, is an electron donor, it's easy to see how bilirubin could replace vitamin C and E in times of need. So when doctors consider bilirubin to be dangerous without exception and decide they need to get rid of this antioxidant, they actually can cause more problems that the mother might not see. Putting babies under a blue light lowers the vitamin C, it lowers the glutathione, and it causes additional oxidative stress to the baby. Blue lights are also lower the albumin, in addition to lowering the bilirubin, which we now know is an antioxidant. But what happens is the bilirubin binds to that albumin when the bilirubin levels are high, and it prevents that bilirubin from getting into the brain, which is the real reason there is any real concern about that bilirubin, is encephalitis. <clears throat> Vitamin C is vital for babies and for everyone else, not only because it's a powerful antioxidant and detoxicant, but because it's the foundation of the following crucial day-to-day -day processes. <clears throat> Now we're going to talk about structure and the integrity of, of tissues, which is really dependent upon vitamin C. We can't make good bones without having enough vitamin C. The eye is loaded with collagen. The inside of the eye is loaded with collagen. Again, very dependent, and there are very high levels of vitamin C in the eye. Skin can break down and become vulnerable to disease with low levels of vitamin C. Muscles and tendons and ligaments are also dependent upon vitamin C because they're full of collagen. These are blood vessels, and you can see that there are different um, circular layers of blood vessels. And each one of those layers is made up of cells, and those cells are kind of glued together with what the medical system calls ground substance, which is made of collagen. So if you don't have enough vitamin C, uh, you can see that these layers could peel apart, and inflammation could occur, and then the 
what's called the disease of atherosclerosis is actually an attempt to patch this problem up when it happens. So making collagen matrix is like knitting wool. It starts with very thin strands that are made there, which a spinner would ply together to make a three ply piece of wood, which is what you're familiar with, which you can buy in a store. Well, the body does this by taking these proteins that are created in specialized cells and weaves them together to make a strand like that. Well, for every OH and every kink you see here, one molecule of vitamin C is used. So you can imagine that making collagen and making bone utilizes enormous amounts of vitamin C. So each of those smaller fibrils that I showed you in the previous slide <clears throat> needs to become incorporated into these larger fibers, which are then cross-linked into this scaffolding where minerals are deposited. This process also requires vitamin C because there's an enzyme for both of those processes that is dependent upon vitamin C. So the cells that make collagen need it because all cells need it, but they also need it in order to keep those enzymes active. Then vitamins K and D are called on to bring mineral, what's called mineral appetites. So bone is not just calcium, but it requires phosphorus and copper and zinc and magnesium, boron, silica, and the trace minerals, all of which strengthen the collagen matrix. Collagen is needed to keep the bones flexible and the minerals are needed so that the bones stay straight and strong. All of this is very important for babies. Breast milk, adds its own bone orchestrating hormone called osteoprotegerin, which results in much stronger bones, not just for the newborn, but this lasts throughout life and into the retirement years. So the calcium in breast milk is also much more bioavail bioavailable than it is in formula. So it's not all about vitamin C. There are many other factors to healthy bones, but when you get the bones right, the rest of the body generally follows. When you get the bones wrong, the body will generally rob and steal from the bones in order to stay alive. There are other times when high levels of vitamin C are needed. Apart from day-to-day -day processes which healthy vitamin C containing food might be enough for, there are some unpredictable events which, might, which need much higher doses than you can get just from your diet. Anytime there is sepsis or overwhelming infections, the vitamin C can be bactericidal and also fuels the white blood cells to do the job that they need to do. Sepsis in critical care is vital to have vitamin C being given during these times. The medical literature has plenty of articles showing that during trauma and surgery and burns, that not only do vitamin C levels drop, not only do histamine levels go up and there's fluid leakage, but that giving vitamin C can reverse that. Endotoxin is a toxin that's produced by bacteria, usually in the bowel, uh, but can be in other places. And so when that happens, the liver has to deal with it. And the liver needs vitamin C in order to deal with it. And vitamin C also directly deals with endotoxin. I talked about the vascular integrity and the antihistamine effect of vitamin C, which is well acknowledged in medical literature. You don't want to have a case of whooping cough without having vitamin C as far as I'm concerned. It makes a huge difference. It's not a miracle. It doesn't make it go away. It doesn't prevent whooping cough, but it turns it into a cough that can be managed at home without needing antibiotics or a doctor or anyone to panic. Um, people in New Zealand have been treating whooping cough with vitamin C for 30 years. I've started treating whooping cough in newborn babies and everyone up to old age with vitamin C and have nothing but happy patients and happy parents with their children now having 30 to 35 years of immunity, solid immunity. Vaccine reactions are another indication for vitamin C because vaccines have toxins that need to be neutralized by vitamin C. They set off an oxidative stress bonfire, which can be helped by vitamin C. Antihistamine is needed during, after a vitamin C reaction as well. So where is the evidence that vitamin C works for something as serious as sepsis? because you might think it doesn't exist given what you see happening in hospitals today. Well, it turns out that there is a new study that looked at very ill septic patients with a variety of illnesses that even included pre-existing kidney failure and hospital-acquired kidney failure, post-operative patients, organ transplant patients, liver failure patients, diabetics, gout patients, influenza, 
um, I know this slide isn't great, but it kind of gives you an idea of, of what, th this is a list of all the problems that these patients had. They were really sick and it had a really broad spectrum of illnesses. So this study used moderately high doses of, of, of vitamin C. I would have chosen to use higher doses, but this was still pretty good. What we have here in the blue is the placebo. The green is the lowest scorbate, which was 50 milligrams per kilogram over a period of 24 hours. The red is 200 milligrams per kilogram over 24 hours. So about 14,000 milligrams was given intravenously in the high dose. <clears throat> and you can see over here on the left, this is called C-reactive protein, and it's an indicator of inflammation. The placebo, you can see the C-reactive P C-reactive protein levels remained high, but in the low and the highest scorbate levels was markedly and significantly, statistically significantly lower. And by the end, you can see the highest scorbate levels definitely made a big difference. Then over on the right is something called the sequential organ failure assessment score, otherwise known as SOFA. So this uses various parameters of illness to predict more mortality. An increase in this score in the first 48 hours of an intensive care unit stay predicts mortality rate of at least 50%. As you can see, vitamin C in these patients was highly beneficial. The higher dose was more beneficial in lowering that SOFA score, that indicator of mortality. But look up here, look at these patients who got placebo. That SOFA score didn't budge. Look at the difference it made. I mean, this is, we're talking about life and death here in intensive care units in patients who don't get vitamin C. Their risk of mortality being 50% within, within the first 44, 48 hours doesn't even change if they don't get vitamin C. And look at the difference after they do. So the results infer that if these patients got IV vitamin C immediately upon admission, that their risk of dying would be significantly lowered. The longer the delay in giving vitamin C, According to this, the higher the mortality would be. Is there any excuse for doctors not to learn about vitamin C during sepsis or any illness today? You know, all I'm finding is more and more evidence within our medical literature that shows that it does help. It's baffling to me that vitamin C isn't a first line treatment for all kinds of acute injuries, for any kind of infection in the hospital. Um, there's not, it's not a matter of not enough information. For me, it's a matter of there's so much information showing the benefit of vitamin C that I hardly have time to get through it all. So if you're looking at what's normal and what you might use for treatment, the following is core information in terms of natural versus synthetic vitamin C. Now I'm talking about vitamin C supplements for when people are sick, but there's, we should always be eating lots of fruits and vegetables that have natural vitamin C and the flavones that go with it. There's really no substitute for that. So when you're eating natural um, food like this, you're getting the vitamin C and you're getting all the cofactors and the flavones that preserve the vitamin C in there and that do other beneficial things in your own body. Now that doesn't mean that vitamin C does, that, that ascorbic acid doesn't cure scurvy. Ascorbic acid and the sodium ascorbate is the active portion of vitamin C, no matter how you look at it. So that's why that works during cases of scurvy or sepsis. So if we look here, all I did was I Googled uh, foods that have high vitamin C content, and I got a bunch of different sites that agreed on, upon the following data. Um, just one red pepper has 300 milligrams of vitamin C in it. Uh, two feijoas, sorry, three feijoas, this is actually a guava, but since a feijoa is a pineapple, pineapple guava, and we have so many of them here, I looked that up. So three feijoas give you 100 milligrams of vitamin C. You get 80 milligrams in a chopped cup of kale. You get 140 milligrams for two kiwi fruits, 82 milligrams in a chopped cup of broccoli, 133 milligrams and 100 grams of parsley, 11 milligrams per berry, 70 milligrams per citrus fruit, and two tomatoes, about 60 milligrams. <clears throat> so when we're looking at synthetic vitamin C for treatment of unexpected acute conditions, there are various options. When you use intravenous, you get the highest levels in the blood, hands down, no argument. But most of it is out of your system in about six hours. So if you want to have ongoing vitamin C by that route, you either have to be hooked up to a continuous drip or you have to keep getting doses every six hours, and that's not practical. So if you're getting IV and you want to have ongoing levels, you really need to be taking oral vitamin C at the same time and dose it throughout the day. So sodium ascorbate powder here 
is inexpensive and it's very effective for daily supplementing. And it's what I use when I want a daily supplement or when I feel any illness coming on, I'm usually able to abort it within several hours. You can get about five grams of vitamin C and a teaspoon of sodium ascorbate. I like this brand. You can get it here in New Zealand uh, from iHerb.com and it doesn't have any GMOs in it. Liposomal vitamin C is very efficient in that you don't need special transporters to get it into your body. So if you're really depleted and really sick, uh, this gets into the body really easily without using any energy in those transporters that I showed you. So for babies or when bowel tolerance is a big deal, uh, I like to recommend liposomal vitamin C. But if you're dealing with any kind of bowel toxins, endotoxins, or exotoxins, like what happens with whooping cough, I really think you need to have sodium ascorbate powder along with it and be using it to bowel tolerance and getting at least two loose bowel movements per day if there's no contraindication to that, like a bowel obstruction or any other common sense problem, then you combine these two and you can get really good effects just from doing that. There's another type called ascorbyl palmitate, and this is water soluble on one end of the molecule and it's fat soluble on the other end of the molecule, so theoretically it's supposed to permeate fat better. Uh, it's rather expensive, and so it's really not ideal for taking high doses of or for taking regularly. But if, if you want to have, you know, different compartments of the body being targeted, this is something you could add to um, a regimen of multivitamin C. You might have heard the same thing I heard throughout my medical career, is that by taking higher doses of, of, of vitamins will just give you expensive urine. Well, that might be true, but it also will give you more expensive blood. And this sh slide here shows that. So say you take a dose of 100 milligrams, and 80% of that is bioavailable. That means that you'll absorb 80 milligrams. Now, if we go to 1,250 milligrams, what the medical system says is true. It's only 46% bioavailable, but you're getting 575 milligrams absorbed. So even though you're, you're, you're not absorbing as much, relatively speaking, you're still getting more vitamin C into your system. And then anything that you've absorbed here can also get recycled into those cells that I showed you and end up being even higher dose than that. It also turns out that people that take vitamin C regularly, uh, the bowel tends to get more um, accustomed to it and you can have better bioavailability that way. <clears throat> this shows that you can get very high blood levels with oral dosing after you are depleted, or even if you're not depleted, actually. The National Institute of Health says that a level of 70 to 80 is where the blood saturation occurs, but Dr. Hickey showed that that's incorrect. He actually took two subjects, and these are people who are regular vitamin C takers, and he had them stop taking vitamin C for 12 hours, and they're not listed on here, but their levels, even after fasting and not taking vitamin C for 12 hours, ranged between 100 and 150. So people who are taking vitamin C regularly tend to not have their levels drop so quickly like this, and that's because where you've had it stored can be actually released into the blood to be used. The National Institute of Health also says that you can't get a level above 220 orally, but Dr. Hickey also showed that wasn't true when he gave these two subjects 36 grams of oral liposomal vitamin C and got their levels up to almost 400. So the message on this slide is not to go home and take 36 grams of oral liposomal vitamin C. Um, they did get diarrhea, by the way, from it. But that if you take throughout the day, say you were taking two packs maybe every two to three hours if you're really sick, you, you keep your blood levels up to a good level, probably around 200 to 250 if you did something like that. And again, over here, you can see that even after this one dose of 1,250 milligrams, that the blood level dropped after about four hours. So if, you, if you're sick and you're wanting to treat this illness and keep the... Um, you know, the white blood cells with the fuel that they need, then you need to continue taking doses throughout the day. So instead of taking a huge whopping dose, just take smaller doses throughout the day and you're gonna have more steady and higher blood levels. Okay, so the prior slide, we were talking in the level of 400 micromoles per liter, and this was with oral dosing. Now here, we're talking intravenous, and you can see it's a big difference. So 400 is down here. But when you take a dose of 100 grams intravenously of vitamin C, you can get a level of 15,380. 50 grams IV will give you a peak of around 13,800. 
10 grams is down here around 6,000. But you can see that within six hours, most of it's out of the system. So it does give you a big burst, which can be really helpful in severe diseases like cancer because uh, the, the concentration of vitamin C in the cell um, is more uh, deadly to cancers at higher levels. I can't tell you what doses to take per se because all of our conditions and all of our bodies are different and our needs are different and even different illnesses require different amounts of vitamin C, but I can give you some general opinion of what I think. If you're healthy and you're stress-free and you have minimal toxin exposure and you eat lots of organic fresh produce, no supplement is required. Does anybody in here fall under that category? I did for a couple of, week, couple of weeks this summer. It was kind of nice. Um, but you can consume foods that have 200 to 1,000 milligrams a day very easily. You can even consume foods that have 2,000 milligrams per day. Um, so it's, it's not impossible to get the amount that you need for maintenance from food. And I still say that that's the way to go whenever you can. If you have chronic illnesses, higher doses are generally needed, and it depends on what the illness is, how long it's been going on, what your tolerance is. And so, again, I can't give a recommendation for that other than to say that most people with chronic illnesses benefit from having vitamin C, as well as having a good nutritious diet. Other indications for everyday use, excessive oxidative stress, if you're getting too much sun or radiation. You know, radiation basically uh, goes in and knocks an electron out of place and causes a chain reaction within your body. If there's high po air pollution or any kind of other pollution around you, any kind of chemical exposures, alcohol, smoking, or any drugs, even pharmaceutical drugs, uh, then you're probably going to benefit from some vitamin C. Elderly tend to have higher inflammation levels and tend to have higher oxidative stress levels and generally lower vitamin C levels. So um, my recommendation is at least two grams per day in elderly. Don't ask me to define elderly. I think I'm approaching that myself, actually. Um, travel usually need higher than usual doses. When traveling, you know, the air quality in airplanes is terrible. You're not eating the food that you're used to. Um, you're drinking water that you're uncertain of. And I definitely know that when I travel, I need much higher than usual doses. I can sometimes take 30 grams of sodium ascorbate in a day when I'm traveling and have no ill effects from it whatsoever. And I don't get sick when I do that. So, if you go into any uh, health food store or pharmacy, you're going to see on the shelf the most commonly available type of vitamin C is called ester C, which is calcium ascorbate. And it's my opinion and the opinion of other uh, experts in the field, like Dr. Thomas Levy, who, um, who wrote a book called Primal Panacea that I think that anybody that wants to know more about vitamin C and have tons of references and a really entertaining and easily readable book should get this book. But he also wrote another book called Death by Calcium. And in that book describes what the problem is with having too much calcium in the system. Calcium ascorbate, if you take a four gram dose of calcium ascorbate, you'll get about 400 milligrams. So if you're needing high doses for over long periods of time, you're going to have a calcium buildup in your system. Now, if all you have in the house is calcium ascorbate and you're getting sick, go ahead and take it because at least you're getting the ascorbate. But send somebody out within 24 hours to get you sodium ascorbate because that's going to be better for you. The problem with having too much calcium is that it can build up into the soft tissues, into the heart and the blood vessels, and it's problematic. You may or may not know that one of the most effective and common blood pressure lowering drugs is called a calcium channel blocker. And the reason that works so well is because most people are overloaded with calcium. The other problem with calcium ascorbate is that it's not physiologic. To absorb uh, um, vitamin C in the bowels, the transporter there takes in two sodiums and one ascorbate. It doesn't take in two calciums and one ascorbate. So if you take sodium ascorbate, you're already putting into your body what the transporters use to bring it into your system. People will say, well, I want calcium ascorbate because it's buffered. Well, sodium ascorbate is also buffered. And if you take a little taste of ascorbic acid and compare that to sodium ascorbate, you'll realize very rapidly that sodium ascorbate is buffered. The other thing with calcium ascorbate is that it uses re relatively high heat in the manufacturer and it produces some of that used up um, uh, vitamin C called dehydroascorbic acid. 
that can turn into oxalic acid in the body and then will have to be recycled by those cells that usually recycle. Um, this just shows you a very interesting study that looked at the milk protein intake in grams compared to the male mortality rate in different countries. And briefly, you can see that male mortality rate is highest in countries who take in a lot of milk protein or calcium. Another question I'm often asked is, what about people who have this disease called glucose-6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, otherwise known as G6PD deficiency? This is a problem because hemolysis can occur in this rare disorder if mega doses of vitamin C are given. But there are cases of even those people tolerating vitamin C at high doses uh, if they are deficient or if they're sick. They can tolerate up to six grams of vitamin C orally when they're sick. So there are no reports of this hemolysis problem uh, when oral intake by these people um, is less than six grams per day or in healthy adults at any dose. The other thing is that several commonly prescribed drugs and some foods can also cause hemolysis in people that have this. I wrote an extensive article on, um, on why, asking why nobody is researching vitamin C and whooping cough. And in that article, I talked about glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency and showed a chart of, of all the foods and um, drugs that are commonly prescribed in the hospital that can also cause this hemolysis. And it can be found uh, at that website there, and that's the title of it. Last slide here is just addressing the issue of kidney stones, because that's another thing I'm asked as a kidney doctor. And I've reviewed the literature on this. Kidney stones are horrible. You don't want them. And so I take very seriously the potential of somebody developing kidney stones if I have them on vitamin C. And here you can see they can block any part of the urinary tract. You can actually have kidney stones that are called staghorn stones that take up this entire area. Um, you can have ones that block the tube going down to the bladder. They're extremely painful. Women who have had natural childbirth and kidney stones say they're about the same. The kidney stones might actually be worse. Uh, very painful, causes blood in the urine, can actually shut down the kidneys. We don't want this to happen, so I'm not taking this lightly. But this doctor, Dr. Wanzelak, showed that the concerns about creating kidney stones by taking vitamin C are unwarranted. A lot of the old literature talks about the potential of causing kidney stones, calcium oxalate kidney stones, because as you heard me say, that breakdown product of vitamin C becomes oxalate. But the concerns were unwarranted and the alarm bells were unfounded because what they were looking at was urine specimens. And in the process of evaluating those urine specimens for oxalate, they were actually turning the vitamin C that was in the urine into oxalate. And so he looked at people who had up to 10 grams of vitamin C per day intakes and found that the increase in oxalate was minimal and that there was no increase in stone formation as a result. There are also two very large prospective cohort studies that show the stone risk in males was actually lower in men who took gram doses of vitamin C on a daily basis, and that there was no increased risk in women who took gram doses on a daily basis. Now, you will see case reports in the medical literature that rarely will implicate vitamin C retrospectively, meaning a patient comes into the hospital, they're dehydrated, they have kidney failure, and they tell the doctor that they've been taking vitamin C. And the doctor will immediately jump on vitamin C as the problem. We've gotten kidney biopsy reports that showed that there were indeed calcium oxalate uh, crystals in there. The thing is, is that you can have primary or secondary oxalosis. There are some diseases that, that actually make too much oxalate in the body. And if you get dehydrated, that can be a problem. And most of these studies don't actually address that problem. But I do think that caution is warranted if you're dehydrated and you want to take a lot of vitamin C. I recommend that people stay well hydrated while they're taking it, that they have good urine flow while they're taking vitamin C. And there may be certain situations like that sepsis study that I showed you where giving vitamin C is still worth it even if your kidneys are shut down because it can save your life. But if that's not the case, get hydrated first and then take your vitamin C. If there's any degree of kidney failure, you want to consider that because a kidney function less than 20% can have you holding on to this oxalate in the body and it can crystallize in the skin and other organs and that's definitely not desirable. <clears throat> 
And with that, our little vole is finishing up his last piece of vegetable. And I'll take any questions that you have. 